Yeah, sounds okay, I think. I'll apologize now that my slides are gonna look a bit weird in certain places. I naively trusted Windows PowerPoint to suggest some fonts and layouts and <laughs> Okay, they, um, as you can see. Anyway, um, this, is, uh, this is shifting from one mega diverse insect group to another, uh, in this case, the Lepidoptera, uh, the moths and butterflies. Uh, and uh, I would say that uh, we only aspire at this point to be as advanced as Thomas has just described with the, well, that worked, uh, with the, the diptera. So uh, moths and butterflies, they're hyperdiverse. Um, estimates vary from somewhere around 160 to 180,000 described species. I strongly suspect it's much closer to 200,000 uh, for reasons I'll give a little bit later. Uh, they contribute 3.5% of all GBIF data, and if you ignore birds, uh, it's nearly 10%, uh, and it's about the same proportion of iNaturalist data. So these are highly recorded, very important insect group, play a very key role as, um, as consumers of a wide variety of plant and other sources, and therefore can be seen as excellent uh, indicators of the, the diversity of ecosystems, et cetera. But what's the state of our names? Uh, until 2021, uh, the source that we were using for uh, Lepidoptera names within Catalog of Life and therefore within uh, GBIF and other uh, aggregated data, data sets was primarily LEP index or the Global Lepidoptera Names Index from the Natural History Museum in London. And this was the database version of a card index uh, with several hundred thousand index cards that have been put together over many decades at the Natural History Museum, primarily to allow their own researchers to find the literature relating to particular names. Uh, so its purpose was not to be a taxonomic checklist, uh, but once it had been databased, uh, it served de facto as by far the largest uh, data set of uh, moth and butterfly names we have. Uh, it was probably kept very current by the Natural History Museum, at least for things from Western Europe um, and English language, up to around 1981. But the names on the cards, they may be the original published combination. They may be a fairly recent combination, but they're much more likely to be whatever combination was used somewhere around 1950, 1960. Um, uh, and on the original cards, there's a fair number of misspellings. On the databasing, there are many more misspellings, um, thanks to the optical character recognition and the subsequent editing. So this is what we've been using until very, very recently. Uh, around 2017, uh, the, the LEP index data set was imported and slightly cleaned and improved in certain areas uh, as a data set in TaxonWorks. Uh, unfortunately, until relatively recently, it was very hard to get data out of TaxonWorks. That's now pretty much solved. Getting, importing new data sets into TaxonWorks is still a little bit complicated. But this is uh, a place where we've been continuing to edit and clean up uh, a lot of the, the content from LEP index. Uh, and uh, all, all praise and thanks to uh, the team in Illinois. Uh, it is a very functional tool for doing most of the things I want to do. And, and here we're talking for Lepidoptera, as with the other recent talks, uh, as primarily being focused on names, uh, current organization of those names into taxon concepts by synonymy and um, replacement names, et cetera, uh, and the associated literature. Uh, additionally, however, as well as the global Lepidoptera index, which is what we're calling the version in taxon works, uh, Catalog of Life uses uh, a number of other resources that we just completely replace particular families because we have much more up-to-date and current data sets. A number of these have been added very recently, uh, the Cesia dye or the, the glasswing moths um, and uh, the, the tortricids uh, from tortricid net uh, and uh, the, the gelechiids are also quite recent. Uh, and since this, um, we're also just about, we hope, to, uh, to bring in uh, the, the recent new 
uh, ghost moth classification. This ugly table, um, the short story is that uh, as we've gone through, or it's mostly me, uh, trying to clean up sections of the global Lepidoptera index, i.e. what was Lep index, I've focused particularly on certain, certain groups where um, I may have started with one paper and then started sinking deeper and deeper into the history of, of those groups and tried to bring them pretty much up to date. So things like the, um, the Alakistinae, uh, the Lecithoceridae, um, and uh, the Psychidae, which for some reason, oh, it, it's probably off the bottom there, um, are ones where I've, I've gone through and I have processed thousands of papers and, um, and publications to try to bring them up to date. The numbers you see on the right-hand side are the uplift in percentage of numbers of species, quite ignoring all of the fixes to individual names, the number of species in those groups following that work. So the Elachistinae, and, and pretty closely the less of the Ceridae, doubled in size once I did that. Um, I would let you know that LEP index always reported itself as 95% complete for Lepidoptera. Uh, if I take the average of all of these, um, the, the uplift, based, you know, taking into account the sizes of the different groups, the uplift in size indicates that LEP index, and therefore prior to edits, um, the global Lepidoptera index was missing, um, at least, there's at least an additional 28% that needs to be added. My estimate is that it's much closer to 40 because that number is significantly dragged down by the geometrids where people at the Natural History Museum had done an awful lot of work in LEP index itself. Uh, and uh, a, a simple test, I've just, just spent some time working on the lichen moths, the lithosiany, um, where most of what's been done in Asia in the last 30 years was absent. Uh, and again, I've just added 43% to that tribe. So there's so much work still to be done uh, and a lot of fixes uh, to take place with the names that are there. Uh, now, what does that actually mean in practice? Yeah, we, we'd like to have a complete list, but if we take uh, the, the sort of use case for GBIF and many other data, uh, data portals as our test, uh, we could ask the question, if I was still using LEP index for the Psychidae and the genus Elachista, uh, the blue circles represents the, the number of names that uh, were in LEP index for both of those, and the, the buff colored ones uh, indicate the number of names now that we've done some more work. The overlap is the number of names where they were spelled the same, they had the same authorship, including parentheses, which is probably the highest threshold here, and where they resolved the same current accepted name. In other words, 88% of names that are now in the Global Lepidoptera Index were incorrect in some way, either absent or not doing the things they should do or having bits missing in the spelling in, uh, in LEP index. Um, now, I'm, I'm flagging this not particularly to grumble about LEP index, which is a fantastic data set in its own right, uh, or the work of the Natural History Museum, just to highlight how quickly a large data set of this kind starts to decay and become more and more out of touch with real world uses of the names if we don't take the time to, um, to, keep, it, to keep it current. Uh, I've put together a few uh, very ugly graphs. Um, my, my use of matplotlib was, was hardly great, but um, we'll go through them anyway. Uh, what I've done here is um, the, the bars here represent the families uh, in the Lepidoptera. And so this is a very simple one. The one on the left, um, it's just indicating how many very small families there are in the Lepidoptera. The scale along the bottom is the number of names associated with each family. Um, and the, the vertical bars is the number of families in each of those categories. And to make it at all visible, um, the one on the right ignores anything which has fewer than a thousand uh, names uh, for the family. And, what, and the, the bars that are blue are ones where no work has been done to clean them up in LEP index because we rely on external data sets for those. And so what, what, is in, sorry, what is in taxon works now, I'm not even bothering to put any effort into cleaning up the families that we have from elsewhere. And at some point, we hope to merge them into a single editable tool. 
The bits that are green uh, are the bits which, um, which are pretty much as they came out of LEP index. Uh, the orange ones are ones where we expect soon to bring in other data sets uh, the, for the geometrids and the, uh, the bombisoid moths. Uh, and in those cases, again, uh, we're not really doing any work. The bits that are red are the ones where we've put a lot of effort in. Story there is it's much easier to clean up very, very small families. Ones with one to 10 species, you can clean up in an afternoon. Um, cleaning up most of the others uh, takes a great deal of time. I'm not quite sure why there's that red one right out to the right. Anyway, that was just to indicate the kind of slides I'm doing here. What, what I wanted to do, though, was um, just based on simple processing of the, the, the data records we have with their timestamps and with all of the associated elements, start to explore whether I have ways to identify which parts of the global Lepidoptera index are really the ones most in need of further uh, attention. So if I take the average year of publication of names, you can see quite clearly that the ones where I've put some work in, the ones that are red, um, they, they're nicely over there. Um, the, the average years are 1980 and onwards, et cetera. Whereas we still have some where the, the average years are back in the, the 19th century. Now, in some cases, there are very few species in those groups and there's been no new discoveries, but generally it's an indication of the fact that after 1980, the Natural History Museum's data set didn't expand. The one on the right is looking at percentage of synonyms, which I find fairly uninformative. Uh, lastly, we've got um, exploration, just looking at how many of the names have actually been touched in taxon works since 2017. And you can see that that's, that's obviously a pretty good proxy for what's going on. Uh, and also the number with citations, where uh, the things that we've been working on more recently uh, have, uh, have been obviously enriched compared to their original state. What I'm trying to do is use this to start moving towards having some, some KPIs and some metrics I can use for evaluating exactly how far we're getting with this massive task of cleanup. Um, I would love to work with more lepidopterists from all over the place who are prepared to uh, contribute some fantastic data sets in many cases just to replace sections. I do not even want to touch the butterflies. Their names are a total mess. Everybody keeps describing new genera, moving the species around. Um, if, if anybody has gateways to give me a good butterfly list, um, we'll, we'll, we'll grab it with both hands. Uh, so just lastly, um, maintaining these lists requires massive effort. I hope to get to the point where the kind of outputs that are coming from Pensoft and Plazi and other sources are sufficiently well structured that we can just treat them as the latest, um, uh, I suppose, drifting detritus coming down on our sedimentary levels. Because um, frankly, nobody has a view of the whole of the fauna for most of these groups. And so in practice, any attempt for checklisting is gonna find it very hard to get beyond uh, Thomas's level three. Uh, if we can do that, we're doing well. Um, and then hopefully the next revision will clean up some more of the noise. Um, Taxon Works is fantastic, and I strongly recommend it if you're looking at a platform. But it's relatively hard still to get things in, um, and uh, the learning curve for using it is steep because it's much richer than is needed for this kind of use case. Um, and yeah, please, please help. Thank you. Thank you. There's time for a question, if anybody has. Oh, sorry. 